Good afternoon and welcome to the first PM Studio lunchtime talk of the, dare I say, autumn winter season. Let's keep all our fingers crossed for a bit more sun in September, right? These talks are live every Friday at 1 p.m., beaming out onto your smartphones, laptops, iPads, and living room TVs. And soon they'll be live again from the building. More info on that in the coming weeks. I'm Luke Emery, and I'm the Pervasive Media Studio producer. I'm a white man with a large ginger beard and a small mohawk. I'm wearing a camouflage shirt, and I'm sat in front of a bookcase filled with books. Our lunchtime talks are our chance to throw open the digital doors of the studio and for you to hear more from the people who are part of our community or who are working on things that excite us. And especially big welcome to any viewers out there who are new to the studio, for whom this might be the first time you're engaging with what we do. For all of those newcomers, here's a little bit about us. The studio is a diverse and collaborative community exploring creativity and technology with everything from comedy to coding and product development to performance art. We're a partnership between Watershed, University of West of England, and the University of Bristol, and we're a home for early stage ideas, companies, and a meeting place of both creative and commercial industries. We're a studio space, and we offer desk space, meeting rooms, event space, and professional development, all for free to our residents. Ultimately, we are a safe place for artists to take risk in, risks in their practice and make time for collaboration. For this week's talk, we are extremely lucky to be joined by Meriko Borogov. Meriko is a technologist, designer, photographer, and troublemaker, and she spent 22 years at Apple inventing the media, gaming, and machine learning technologies that are at the heart of many of our tools and art today. She was a founding member of the iPhone team and was responsible for building the iPhone cameras, changing photography and video videography across the globe. There will be, as usual, a Q&A at the end with the talk running roughly 45 minutes. If you want to ask any questions, just pop them into the chat window and I'll pick them out as we go. Uh, or if you would like, you can tweet us at PM Studio UK and please feel free to share this link. Uh, we are live and we'd love as many people as possible to be watching. A captioned and recorded version of the talk will also be available here after the talk is finished. Before we start, next week's talk is by Nick Rawlings. And in this talk, Nick will explore what they've learned through the R&D process that they have been going through as part of their Bristol and Bath Creative R&D Expanded Performance Project. That's a mouthful. It's called Breathing Systems, and they're gonna talk us through their approach to spatial composition and the place of wireless systems in the future of, of sonic practices. You can get news on all our future talks by heading to watershed.co.uk forward slash studio, following us on at PM Studio on Twitter or at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram or subscribing to our newsletter on the website. Don't forget, while you're sat there listening to you talk, subscribe to this YouTube channel and give the video a thumbs up. The more subscribers we get, the more likes we get, the more we can share stories like this. For now, I'm going to hand over to Mariko. Hey, folks. Thanks so much for having me. So again, my name is Mariko. I come from San Francisco, California, but I have the almost, it feels unimaginable privilege to be here in Bristol today, live from the Pervasive Media Studio at the Watershed. I actually have a half a dozen people who are sitting next to me and um, it just feels really wild. So I guess I'm your in-between spot between your coming back to the Watershed for everyone. Um, and I'm really grateful to be here. It's been lovely. So my pronouns are she, her, and they, them. I'm a middle-aged white queer woman. I've got brown hair cut in a bob. I'm wearing red lipstick and a black top, a gray scarf, a green panamu. And I'm standing in front of a colorful artwork that I believe is a nice piece of projection mapping happening on the building across from the watershed. And I come to you today with a personal love of theater, of film, of storytelling, and the connection and transformation that these arts foster. I also come to you with a history of building the foundation technologies that power games, movies, CGI, and immersive technology, as well as some of the interactive tools and products that sit on top of them. And some of the most exciting work that I'm doing sits at the intersection of live theater, storytelling, and emerging media technologies. We're deeply investigating how presence and connection can be fostered in new ways, enabled by all this technology. And I'm quite worked up about it. And we're gonna see, well, there goes my quicker. And there's my first technical challenge. So as a caveat, I am going to tell you a lot of stories about Apple. And I got to say, I'm not a representative of Apple anymore. And I don't speak for them. Like any group affiliation, I'm going to be speaking to my lived experiences. I don't know all the answers or all the stories, nor are they all mine to tell. But I do want to take a moment to acknowledge and stand in solidarity with my former colleagues and the current employees at Apple who are speaking up about toxic environments and practices, and to say that I support their work and their rights to come forward. But in this hour, I'm going to talk about positive aspects of the work that I did, products and teams that I'm quite proud of and still really excited about. 
And while I'm open to personal conversations, I'm not ready to share my own Apple II stories publicly at that time or right now. So if you could respect that in the questions, I'd really appreciate it. Okay, so what did I do? I started at Apple in 1995. I was planning to work for a year before I went off to graduate school to study evolutionary and developmental biology, but I stayed for over two decades. And when I started on the QuickTime team in 1995, Gil Emilio was still the CEO to kind of give you a flavor of what that was like. And when I left in the summer of 2017, I was working as a senior director of engineering in the super secret secret special projects group, uh, which means I can't tell you what it was. Um, but I can tell you about the other things I worked on in those 22 years. I had the immense privilege of contributing to QuickTime, to iTunes, to the first iTunes music store, to Mac OS X, to the iPod, the iSight camera, iChat video, to Aperture, um, I led the Intel transition for graphics and media and worked on all of the modern streaming core graphics, audio and animation frameworks. As Luke said, I was on the original iPhone team and I'm really proud of the work I did bringing machine learning and AR to the forefront at Apple. But people really know me as the person who created the iPhone cameras and the camera teams who frankly did the majority of the lion's share of the real work. And I might have an apology to offer to any cinematographers over here in the audience or on the live stream as the biggest proponent of vertical video once upon a time. Um, you know, people are portrait. <laughs> when you have a really small sensor, you want them to fill it. Um, uh, as a visual description, I have an XKCD comic by Randall Monroe up on the screen talking about horizontal, vertical, and perhaps diagonal video from the day. Now, these days I do advisory work. I work in some creative collaborations um, with a couple of companies in New Zealand, with ScanLab Projects, a creative and technical studio um, here in the UK in London. I do some teaching and researching and I'm enjoying photography with cameras big and small. It's really delightful to have the time to do that. I also spend a lot of time doing uh, political activism work and community service because we got a lot of work on both globally and nationally in the US and locally where I live. And it's interesting because the bulk of this talk that we're going we're gonna to go over, I originally wrote for a really technical software engineering conference in Aotearoa, which we also know as New Zealand. It's incredibly relevant for this sector as well, though, for designers and creators and inventors of experiences that happen in products and museums, in theater and in films. Because in AR and VR and in immersive spaces, we're at the bleeding edge of possibility at the moment. We're starting to show prototypes to a wider audience as first wave products and productions, much like the first iPhone, right? There, were, there was no cut and paste <laughs> on the first iPhone, if anyone had forgotten. Um, we're making things that are really out past the edges of linear two or two and a half D films, things that stretch the space and the props and the reach of a classic theater or immersive performance. People are doing their best to build out their dreams with what's possible today. And the artworks and productions might look like the picture I've got up on screen, which is a piece called Eternal Return by ScanLab Projects and Lundel Seidel. Um, this is a bespoke on location narrative experience that happens in virtual reality with live actors and props and sets that you move around in. Or it might look like this, joining 8,000 other people across the globe to watch a live interactive short play that's set in the forest of a Midsummer Night's Dream. It was built with the high performance Unreal Engine and cutting edge motion capture technology to bring the five actors from the Royal Shakespeare Company who play Puck and the Sprites into a forest while they perform in both a physical and digital stage. And it was also watched on the web browsers of tablets and phones and computers. The production was a collaboration of the RSC, of Marshmallow Laser Feast, the Philharmonia and Manchester International Festival. And it was seen by over 65,000 people from 90 countries, over 10 performances in March. Now, it was a high budget piece of R&D. This is a picture of uh, what it looked like when M was performing um, that leveraged cutting edge technology and theater craft on the stage. And it delivered to device specs that are nearly ubiquitous. This deeply opens up and includes a really wide and a new audience for the sector. It's both beautiful work and research, and we learned a ton doing it. And so in this really kind of weird time, one of the things that I think is a bit of lemonade is that people have been so courageous and vulnerable. They've been sharing so many prototypes of ideas that they would usually keep close. Things with small budgets, things with large budgets from small consortiums, from individuals and from companies. So it's been a really amazing time to learn from all of those prototypes and iteration, if you were lucky enough to be safe. Um, I'm grateful for all the things I learned. And so as we're doing all of this work and experimenting, we are also deeply interrogating the next wave of user interface. We're enabling technology and we're looking at the new storytelling vocabulary that we're gonna discover in this new three-dimensional media type. So AR and VR, if you can cue the movie, um, 
Like it's a deeply new design space and paradigm as well as an emerging technology. The last time we fundamentally changed user interface technology and interaction all at the same time was with multi-touch on the iPhone. Now we're designing 3D interactions with untouchable objects and audience perspective control. And where fiction is our first prototype, we're in a place where no one understands how to utilize attention to tell a story like actors and directors, like cinematographers and musicians. And so there's this really beautiful and entwined synergy going on in this discovery across disciplines. And that, like, it cannot emphasize enough how important that cross-disciplinary energy is. And I'm, I'm just wildly excited by it. So when you're in this sort of technical and creative work, it requires sitting and working with discomfort and uncertainty, right? You're gonna be gobsmacked regularly in both good and bad ways. And then you've got to continue to build and find a new path through. So to dig into the, the meat of the talk, I'll share some tools that we used at Apple to build today's status quo back when it was an unknown set of interfaces and technologies. And as a fair warning, we're gonna zoom around in the timeline a little bit. I will try and situate you by year, by product, and by feature set along the way each time we time shift. And we're gonna start in the iPhone 4 era. Now in the iPhone 4 era, my mission for the camera team was that everybody should be able to take a beautiful photo every time without being an expert. And then for extra credit, pros would have additional control. And we had set the quality bar to point and shoots and DSLRs, not to other camera phones. And the iPhone 4 was a tremendous technical accomplishment for the camera and a huge step forward. We had a five megapixel sensor for the first time. We had an LED flash with proper focus. This was the A4 chip, the first Apple designed chip, which had huge performance wins, including an ISP, that's an image signal processor, that was specified and designed and built just to accelerate the camera. We also had the first backside illuminated sensor, which is pretty nerdy. But it was a big stretch. No one had done that sort of process at scale, either to make it that small or to make that many of them. And it was pretty busted. So we had all hands on deck and we were debugging and resolving across hardware, software, and operations near the end of the program. Um, images kept being green. It was very annoying. And we were in daily reviews with three senior vice presidents. These are the people who reported directly to Steve Jobs to report on experiments from each of us, plot our next steps, and make sure that we were helping each other out. Right, so it's not just the still camera that we also added HD video recording for the first time with focus controls inside of video. And we introduced iMovie and AV Foundation, which was a low level API enabling developers um, to get direct control of the camera and the media systems. And we put a front facing camera on the sucker for the first time and introduced FaceTime. So a lot of work, especially for the teams doing the underlying technology sets. And all of that work came at the cost of investing in other more user level features because our team was still relatively small. So we're gonna talk about two stories, HDR and Panorama. So very near the end of development for the iPhone 4, we got a question from Steve who had been playing with an HDR app, which was conveniently written by the son of an Apple board member. Um, and he called up and he's like, hey, can we do HDR? And I told him, well, it was possible, but it was a lot of work, but we had some ideas, we had some prototypes and he's like, no, 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 I mean, now. <laughs> <laughs> like we had some ideas, but we really needed to do more research. We needed to collect real world images, so many images outside and different lighting. And that phone had a new industrial design. And that was the year that phones got lost in bars. It was a really bad scene <laughs> for taking things outside, but it was, it was rough. So, um, you know, our answer was really, <laughs> no, no, nope. we needed time. And we were still wrapping up all of those features and that BSI sensor was still turning everything green. So a fast turn user level feature, um, not in the cards. But Steve really wanted us to find a way through. He was sure that now was the time for HDR. And a trusted partner of mine from hardware, this guy named Mike Colbert, he came around for a chat and to offer me some help and to brainstorm. And he listened to my challenges, like he really listened. Um, some of them were technical, some were of them were people and you know, mythical man month oriented. And he offered up some ideas of people who might felt well into the team from around the company that he knew and suggested maybe we could try and borrow them. And so we found a few and we worked with them to start building out the feature. And we got pretty far, but we didn't know how to solve for a quality bar in, the in all of the scenarios. In particular, if there was motion in the frame back in the iPhone 4, it was a real problem for HDR. So we looked for another approach and we brought in a UI that wasn't ideal, but kept both photos so that you could have a, a good photo every time. And we released it in September in iOS 4.1 after just three months of work, right? Success, Steve's looking pretty happy. Um, there's some pictures from the keynote up on the slides at this point. And I'm gonna to transition to talking about the other feature of that era, panorama. 
which is a little bit different than HDR. Panorama originated directly from engineering, specifically from a guy named Frank Dopey, who was on my team. As we finished the iPhone 4 and started working on the 4S, Frank dropped by my office with an idea and a prototype. And so making panoramas was a major pain, even with a DSLR and a pro camera rig. He'd been playing with a new DSLR that for the first time had a screen on the back and it was helping you line up the edge of your last frame in a series to help minimize distortion and help you stitch it later. Given the capabilities of the iPhone and 4S, he thought we could develop technology that would let us do a continuous sweep, right? To capture high resolution, high quality images that looked like something shot with a large wide angle lens. So we took the prototype into review and the marketing design and application counterparts all agreed we should pursue it. And we jumped in. We leveraged the speed of the new sensor, the ability to process on that A4 chip. Um, we really clever idea to take very small slices that minimize distortion to make processing easier. And we used the really precise gyro that was new to the iPhone 4S to automatically stitch the slices together in real time. Now, our camera principles I mentioned included the user interface. And the first was to keep the capture screen WYSIWYG, or what you see is what you get. The image on the screen needed to reflect what was being captured. So tap to focus was really tap on what you care about and we'll take care of the rest. That how to do pro things made sense to non-photographers so most people could use them. And we were working deeply with our design team throughout all of the, the algorithm work, looking for the right user interface to teach the sweep gesture that you probably all know today for shooting a panorama. And we did so many reviews and so many designs and so many tests and so many prototypes, and there were some problems. <laughs> I found this early test shot in my archives that demonstrates how low light noise was affecting stitching. Um, if you can't see the slide, uh, it looks terrible. It became clear that we didn't have the right UI to help people make a good panorama in all situations. You could take a gorgeous photo if you knew what you were doing, and if you didn't, not so much. We didn't know what a good or correct solution was, but we all really wanted to ship it. Like we were making 28 megapixel images from a five megapixel sensor that people couldn't tell the difference from a wide angle lens on a DSLR. No one was doing this in a pro camera. No one was doing this in a point and shoot or in an app on an iPhone. And we were so proud of it. But we got to the end of the schedule and we didn't have the UI. So I had to make the really difficult choice to not ship it with the 4S. And it was painful because we knew we probably wouldn't be able to put it in dot release like we did for HDR because it was such a big feature. But we kept at it. We found the right UI, which at this point seems so obvious in retrospect. This is the terror of good design of brand new things. Um, and ended up shipping it with the iPhone 5 a year later. So we just talked about two ways to get it done. With HDR, we got some help and found a UI compromise to enable us to compress the schedule and get it out the door. And with Panorama, we gave ourselves more time to prioritize getting the absolute right user experience. And those sound like opposites, but there's a commonality in this, which was in both cases, we didn't let I don't know mean no. When there are a thousand no's for every yes, when and how you say yes, or say maybe, or sit with the I don't know for a while is really hard. And it's germane because I believe that engineering and design are fundamentally creative practices. And all of you know this, when you're doing work in a creative endeavor, you will absolutely run into this, the undefined, the unknown, and the uncertain. And it can be really hard because your gut will say no, because shutting it down makes it go away pretty quickly. But I hold that saying yes or maybe sometimes is absolutely necessary, especially when you're in a breaking walls endeavor, which we're in the middle of a bunch of those right now. So we'll come to my truth, which is that I know that uncertainty can make better products and technologies and leaders. Now the key is in your approach. So some people frame the state of unknown as risk uh, and some people delight in the freedom of it. <laughs> but the kicker is, is that it's both. Two things can be true at once. It's often the practice of holding them both together that can show you the way through um, or keep you from wanting to throttle your partners who are building your foundations or making content beyond what you can actually put out there. Um, and people ask, why are we talking about this now? And we talked about some of the emerging technology reasons earlier, but at a more individual level in the coaching work I do, I regularly get requests for help that sound like, hey, America, my team is really struggling with the motivation to build something that might not get out the door. Or my team doesn't wanna work on this thing because they don't have a full spec from design or a requirements document from product or a set of capabilities from engineering, right? Any sorts of teams. Or I hear that people don't wanna be responsible for something that has a lot of dependencies on other teams or moving parts because they're afraid it'll fail. And when we work through their specific scenario, getting comfortable working with the unknown 
is almost always part of the solution. So what does that sound like? Like, how do you recognize that if that's going on in your day-to-day -day world? Because it's fine for me to tell you that in theory, but you know, it might be that the work is open-ended or you don't know how to solve a key problem. Maybe you don't know the end answer that you're striving for yet. <laughs> Maybe it's worse and you don't even know the right question to ask yet. <laughs> Maybe you have to work without a spec or outside of your defined role. Maybe the work doesn't fit in the schedule. Right? Those are all places where you can signal maybe there's an uncertain core in there. And so I'm about to outline some tools and approaches to use when you hear yourself asking or feeling those sorts of things, things that I learned while I worked at Apple. And we're going to go with three case studies, one that centers technology, another that centers process, and the third that centers people. And while creative work is widely, like wildly, wildly contextual, the unknown and the uncertain really come in many shapes, sizes, and containers. We, we, we can start with a universal truth, which is that uncertainty is really profoundly uncomfortable for most people. And people are rarely their best selves when they're uncomfortable. At best, they want to feel better as soon as they can. And at worst, they feel really threatened and unsafe. And nobody does good work when they feel threatened and unsafe, especially in a transformative moment, right? In this liminal space, when you're trying to convert a dream to reality, to share a new vision with the wider world, when you might be limited in the capabilities and the things that you wanna show or have compromised output, this can be really intense for people. So your, your first step is to recognize you're in the space. We talked about that, to identify and acknowledge your uncertain core. Okay, so how, how, are you gonna, how are you gonna identify it? Well, you can listen for these things. Maybe you're super uncomfortable with saying, I don't know, or I don't know how, um, and that feels bad. Maybe like you're really afraid of the chaos. Maybe you're super anxious or you realize that you're saying no to everything or worse, your team tells you you're saying no to everything or that you're close to ideas. Those are all really good signals to listen for. Um, or maybe you're saying this a lot. I've got a gif up of Scotty from Star Trek saying, I cannot change the laws of physics because I definitely said that to a senior vice president or two in my time working on the camera. At any rate, if you hear any of those things or feel them, then you start getting to the root cause. You can start um, ticking at that and looking. And if it's a mistake or a misunderstanding or a crappy bug, like we can talk about that in another talk. But if what you unearth is an unknown or an uncertainty, then figure out what that unknown is and choose and deploy some tools. Like get into it intentionally. So you can start by reframing how you think about it, right? This is a pretty classic design exercise and it really works. When you find an undefined spot, Think about how you work with it instead of against it. And I do that by getting curious. Um, that's my nature, but it's a thing that you can practice as well. Being curious helps you get creative about the unknown rather than letting fear rule the work. You can be curious and uncomfortable. Both of those things can be true at once. I'm sure almost everybody has been in that state together. And so what does that look like? Again, like it's fine for me to say the words, but what, is, what does that look like in action? Well. You can be open to experimentation. You can look for ways to make room for it. Maybe you're making room in the schedule for the uncertainty or in your team. Uh, maybe you can take that uncertainty and surround it with structure. Maybe that's process, maybe that's code, maybe that's testing. You can think further ahead. If you can cast ahead a year or two or five years and think about what you want your product to be doing or how you want your film to feel or what you want your architecture to look like, it can help you pick the direction for your smaller step right now. And those are my tools for a curious mindset. Okay, so your second tool is your people. And this sounds simple, but it's really true. It's the people who you trust and also trust you. And that trust is really critical. It can, could include your team, your leadership, cross-functional folks, collaborators. And there's the question of, okay, so great, America, I've got people, I trust them, but like, what do I do? Well, the first thing you need to do is listen. And I mean, really listen. <laughs> whether you've asked for their input and advice or they've done you the solid of coming to you proactively. Second thing you can do is ask for help. Again, it sounds simple, but in the moment, it's often really hard to remember to ask for help, especially to ask for help before everything is on fire. And that's a, a sort of key note. And the third is to accept help, both when you ask and also when they offer. Because remember, even if you're uncomfortable and you're like, no, 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 I can do it, or I've got this, I've got this, and all of the things that may come up in that space, remember that these are the people that you trust. So if they're coming to you offering help, they can probably see something that you might not be seeing, and it's probably worth accepting that help. 
And I guarantee it won't be easy because remember you're uncomfortable. They're probably also uncomfortable. So you have to pull out your best practices for communication and damp your ego and be a little bit vulnerable. Okay, so I've been talking for a bit. We have some solid things to do, right? You're gonna recognize you're in the uncertain space and not knock over the laptop or the <laughs> cable. Um, you're gonna interrogate that situation. You're gonna identify the uncertain core and you're gonna get curious about it. You're also gonna leverage your people and you're gonna remember to do the work to hold multiple truths throughout that. Okay, we're halfway through this talk. We're gonna talk about case studies now. And remember, we've got three. The first case study is our engineering and design case. I call this media routing, which is more complicated than you think. And we're time shifting again. So it is now early 2007, um, January, February, we've announced the first iPhone, but we haven't shipped it to the world yet, which will happen in June of 2007. At that juncture, I was leading the IMG or the image and media group embedded teams, the, I, the teams working on iPhone. I was responsible for all of the AV and all of the graphics on the device and the camera. We were constantly fielding bug reports about behaviors and issues with sound from quality engineering and from the apps teams and sound was an absolute disaster. And it's more complicated than you might think. Let's kind of go over it. We'll start with the hardware. Now you have multiple apps that are sharing the same speakers. There's a receiver at the top, there's back speaker at the bottom and also same microphone. And then you also have some transient ones. You have some that connect through the auxiliary jack. You have some that connect through the 30 pin connector and you have some that connect through Bluetooth, which by the way is the worst standard ever written. Not a single hardware implementation is to spec, it's terrible. And you know who has to cope? Software, yeah, software. Shout out to my software engineers. Um, you also have different sources inside of that hardware that are generating the sound. You have media chips, you have the plain old CPU, and then you have the cellular chips that make all of the sound um, for both voice and the tones that come out for, from a phone call. And all of those sources inside the hardware have different capabilities about whether they can mix or interrupt and how they control volume. Now, all of the apps at that time, like the iPod, SMS, the phone, and the browser, they were each managing their sound behaviors and volumes individually, including the interactions with system sounds and vibrations and notifications directly with core audio and core media and the baseband. The baseband is the piece of software that controls phone calls. And everyone had to respect these three controls. There was a single two-state switch that sometimes was a ringer switch and sometimes was a mute switch, depending on what app was running and what that app was doing. And two volume buttons, one for up and one for down. And it was a hot mess. Uh, I have an image up of a pretty messy audio studio <laughs> at the moment. At the launch event in January, um, after that, we were reviewing the biggest risks to the June ship date and Scott Forstall's weekly staff meetings. He was the senior vice president for software and design for iPhone. And audio was always on the top risk list for one reason or another. So in March, Scott made me the DRI, which is Apple speak for directly responsible individual, and asked me and Patrick, a guy from the design team, to go and sort it out and make it a consistent good user experience. Just go be excellent. <laughs> All right, so we set about creating a media routing policy for all of these applications and system services that would share the speakers and microphones, interact with the user's intent with the imperfect capabilities to mix and interrupt with all of those devices coming and going. So we set our high level goal that sound should come from the right place at the right time at the right volume. Brilliant, but it was an enormous situational matrix. And so we built them out lots of butcher paper, lots of whiteboards, lots of beating our head against the wall. And we started looking for patterns. We started proposing policies and trying them out. And it turned out that the key to robustness was to test them against the current scenarios, but also against apps that we hadn't built yet, that we hadn't imagined yet, ones that we would make in the future, but also ones that you all would make in the future. The policies had to be understandable and implementable with a human interface guideline or a HIG. So get this, we've actively invited the unknown from future stuff we haven't defined yet into a ridiculous matrix that we couldn't solve <laughs> out the gate. But through that, we came up with a solution, which was to take the implementation out of applications and drive the behaviors into a single framework that could mediate. This was Media Server D, which is the heart of core media, which made a one-stop shop for mixing and interrupting. And then we went about defining policies to canonize user intent, things like, Sound is recessive and silence is dominant. So if you in any way ask your phone to be quiet, we are gonna believe you. Uh, things like last in wins, meaning the last thing that you connected is the one you want to use. 
And then we defined the behaviors for types of audio that we called categories. Now, if you've built any iOS apps that use media or subscribe to the multitasking API, this should be familiar to you. Um, this, this is still the way it works 13 years later. And then we had to race to implement it all in core media, have the apps rip out their code, adopt it and test it, <laughs> which was a little madcap, but we got through it. But the key here is that the inviting of the unknown of the future drove us to make a robust forward compatible media system where when we changed a behavior because of new hardware or improved software, it would be reflected system-wide for all apps made by Apple and our developers on day one. Working with that uncertainty about the specs absolutely made us invent and build a better architecture. That flexibility served well. We made a much more understandable product and it made engineering and design more responsive so that we could do more interesting things faster. And it included our app developers in that from the get-go. Pretty cool. Okay, case study number two, which is all about process. Um, I sort of cheekily call this story, fix the silicon below the schedule. So I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the principles or the milestones in hardware development. I'm gonna go through them briefly, at least the process that Apple has used for hardware, whether that's silicon or a phone or a Mac. Um, I promise it's relevant. Maybe it'll be of use to you as you work with bleeding edge product development and can ask some people some cheeky questions yourself. So in hardware, milestones are tied to physical builds. This makes sense, right? Hardware is a really physical thing. Now you start with proto builds and they're about developing technology. So you might have a bunch of different parts. You might have like a camera that plugs into a dev board. You might have a display, nothing's built together. You might have some speakers you're working on to develop each of those things. Then you have a build called EVT or engineering validation test which is about bringing those technologies together in a system integration. You move on to DVT or design validation test when you've got them all built into a system and you're flushing out the problems that happen in the build and manufacturing process when they're all um, being built at scale. You have PVT or production validation test and that's when you're building shipment ready units and then you move into ramp which is the process of increasing production to volume. Now, this is true for silicon development and also for system builds of things like phones and Macs. So you might imagine that you're going to need silicon to be at DVT or maybe even at a late EVT, but really at DVT before you start putting it into proto builds of a system build in order for this to work. So traditionally in hardware engineering, things take many years because you might take a year to make the silicon and then it's DVT or PVT and you start putting it in protos of other things. And for reference, GM, which is the software golden master milestone of a phone, the release generally happens after PVT while you're in ramp. Now, the proto builds are pretty rough going if you're a software person. And the only people in software working with those are doing what we call bring up work, which is work that is towards the validation and verification of the hardware. Then between EVT and DVT, teams that work on hardware dependent features, like my camera teams, would start working with development units on software features. In between DVT and PVT, more units are sent first to software for folks to test and work with. That might be when the applications teams start working with them. And units start going to customer sometime after GM during ramp. Now, we're time shifting again. It's late 2006. Um, we're doing the original iPhone development. It's in the fall. Um, we are not sleeping a lot. We're definitely locked behind those doors. We're all a little bit interesting. Um, and we found several show-stopping bugs in the chip. We were well past the proto phase for the phone and we were into DVT of the phone itself. And now fixes in silicon are really tricky and time consuming, right? You have to validate with a new build of silicon and then integrate that into a hardware build that you bring forward. And we weren't building the silicon ourselves for that product. And worse for me, the specific bugs were in memory and in the media, the hardware media systems. So we couldn't run most of the media stack for more than a few minutes at a time without burning up our precious few prototypes. And that sent off this huge avalanche of schedule issues, right? So Apple Silicon experts from the Mac teams got pulled in and started pitching and looking for a solution. And we're trying to get ready for the January event. I'm learning all sorts of new technical terms like chicken bit and to shmoo. These are real, actual, legal hardware technical teams. And the hardware teams conclude, no, 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 we got to make a physical change to the silicon. So they take this thing called a risk fix exception. They take the fix at a time where it doesn't fit the schedule. There's no good way to revert the change if it's wrong. And there's not a lot of time to test it before they do that. And our GM date, our software golden master date is well and truly broken. So we went off to see what we could do in the release schedule for software to help. 
Now, this is a simplified version of the software related milestones. Um, you have some around silicon bring up and hardware bring up. Those are during the proto phases that we talked about for the hardware schedule. Um, we have feature complete, which is a lot like first playable in the game industry. It's all of the features that code paths are in, but they might be pretty broken um, or not work very well or only work in one way down the path. And then the rest of the milestones are really set about closing down the severity of the issues that are reported. So um, then you go to GM and then you ship. So that feature complete date is really important. There's more at stake than just the features being late when you miss that date. There's a raft of surrounding work across the whole platform that it enables. Things like thermal work or desense work. Desense is how the various radios and frequencies affect each other when they're all in use. Working the media system was the most taxing thing you could do with an iPhone. Recording video and doing some AR work, I think, is still up there. And so there are burn-in and reliability tests that happen at the factory and in Apple's labs as well. Now, the date for feature complete allows time for all of that work and testing to be done before ramp. So we're pretty motivated to hit this June ship date, right? We all want to ship this phone. But the schedule was really deeply, deeply broken, and we didn't know how to do it. So a few of us got together to think creatively about how to mitigate the risk in the schedule. And after a lot of gnashing of teeth, what we did is created a new type of milestone, like, okay, that specifically targeted the most efficient evaluation of those fixes. And we needed a name because naming is powerful. So we called them checkpoints. So we track the unknown thing until we got to a checkpoint. And this might be the first result of a hardware test or a first integration test. And for each of them, we'd figure out all of the possible forks in the road and discuss what we would do at each branch in that we do some planning. So changing the process gave us the ability to communicate clearly to the software and the hardware teams, as well as the executives and the operations teams so that they could make informed decisions in their part of the schedule and the work. But it also gave us the space in the media team to look for ways to move quickly when we got to those decision points because we had thought about the various results of those forks. Um, and I'm going backwards suddenly. Maybe. So we were in this meeting and our head program manager kept asking us the same question in that meeting, so much so that it became shorthand when we were in a bind with the unknown. And she would say, we'd say, no, like she'd say, well, when can we roll this out to the app team? And I'm like, I, I don't have a date for you because I don't know when this is going to come and how it's going to work. And she's like, fine. Okay. So when can we have a date for the date? And that date for the date is the thing that defined the checkpoint. So in software, we started thinking about how to minimize risk in those checkpoints. And our media team decided to surround the uncertainty with structure and code. And in this case, we hacked around the issue, right? And it was a clearly unshippable hack. We turned off a bunch of things that couldn't be turned off so that we could get the best results quickly when the hardware fixes came in. And this was a bunch of extra throwaway work. We started thinking of it as scaffolding work that was done to save time in the schedule, which is kind of wacky. We were doing more work to shorten the schedule. And in totality, that new process made space by minimizing the surrounding surprises in code, in hardware, and in communication, which in turn made both better products and better leaders, right? This process to risk develop a system framework in conjunction with mid-development silicon and hardware all in the same year gave us the basis of collapsing a traditional three, four, five-year hardware software dev cycle for a product into a single year. That enabled us to make significant re releases of both hardware and software of the phone every year, which is a huge sea change in consumer electronics. It radically changed the industry. All because we tried to figure out how to handle some uncertainty around some broken silicon in a new way. Pretty cool, no? Okay, three, we're almost done. This is the last use case. Have you ever had a hard time figuring out your title? Because we're gonna talk about people. <laughs> I've often had a hard time describing what I do. I've also had a hard time trying to figure out what the person on the other side of the table is all up in my business for. Because the more bleeding edge your work, the more bleeding edge your process, the greater likelihood you're gonna wind up in a scenario where you don't know how to name yourself or describe. So especially during the iPhone days, I wore multiple hats. I was often managing without reporting structures. I was permanently guested in, into senior vice president staff meetings in both hardware and software. My role had no HR definition on the books because a bunch of people didn't report directly to me as, as a people manager, but some people did. I have a picture of my business card from 2000 to 2007 to 2010 up on the screen right now. Uh, my title read IMG special agent, partly because everything I worked on was really confidential and partly because I wasn't your standard manager or director. So what did my job look like? 
Well, I was both the technical and the product leader for graphics, media, and audio initiatives for iOS. I was participating deeply at the executive leadership and at the design level. I was creating some new roles and teams. I was matrix managing many other folks. I was building new meeting and communication structures to support a common code base between macOS and iOS. And I was figuring out how to build those new hardware products along with our Mac and iPod lines. I had a heap of influence and a ton of responsibility without any formal authority. Folks couldn't name what I did often, but it was widely acknowledged by everybody from senior vice presidents and Steve to individual contributors and my peers that it was absolutely critical. All of those folks chose to hold value in my undefined role, which meant that I didn't need to fight for an org change. I didn't need to fight for a title and they didn't need to exert a rigid ownership model in order to make things wildly better. So for those of you who have a hard time describing what you do, how many of you have a team that's good with that? That's the kind of team that I want to build. Those are the kinds of teams that I like to work with. And I think those are probably the best sorts of teams to work with. And so a key to making that work is something that um, I like to call a cross-functional fabric. And it was absolutely fundamental to Apple when I was there. So Apple was organized by functional group and people pitched in across groups at all layers, right? Remember the silicon example, the HDR one? And this was true of individual contributors as well as the management team and the project managers. The video stabilization engineer knew their peer in core motion who worked on the gyro drivers and they both knew the hardware engineer who was integrating and calibrating those gyros and hardware. And they all talked without anybody telling them to or needing to run it by anyone. Someone saying it's not my problem was usually the surest sign that there was a problem. And those two things are at the heart of the fabric that can make space for these less described and less defined roles that can help knit together some structure around uncertainty. And what I wanna to talk to you about is one of the new roles I created for the iPhone in the camera space. As we focused on the iPhone 3G, I was convinced that we should be holding ourselves to the standards of great point and shoots and DSLRs, not to camera phones. We had built a modern media-based OS. We had a lot of computational imaging knowledge, right? I knew because I worked on camera raw and aperture. And we had the ability to control our hardware, which I learned working on that whole silicon debacle. This is a challenging stance in 2007. Nobody believed we'd want to use our phones as cameras, but I absolutely knew it to be true. So I bought each of the engineers in firmware and software, one of these digital elves, there were only a few of us, and we went to work as this deeply cross-functional team. And our guiding principle was that everyone could take a beautiful photo or video every time without needing to know how. But what is beautiful? Like, how do you define it? Who gets to define it? It's a big question even today. Is it a DxO mark? Is it an AB comparison? Is it a psychophysical study? These are all real things. Before the iPhone, when I was working on camera raw and aperture, we had something called a golden eye team, which was a cross-functional team of people from all over the company. They had all kinds of different jobs who were engineers and color scientists, people who had training in image analysis, but who also had great eyes and perception skills and description skills. We'd review and discuss qualitative trade-offs in image processing in conjunction with the quantitative test results. And I knew, I knew that we needed both for the iPhone. So enter Monique. She was a quality engineer who was sent over from iPod, remember cross-functional helping things out, to help us on the first phone. And she integrated really deeply into our media team. She was working on color fidelity, on codec implementations, on the look and feel of all of our stills and video. And I learned she was also a professional photographer and artist from a large photography studio before she came to Apple. And so she started up an iPhone version of the GoldenEye process, bringing her photography skills into the program as well. And we created a new role for her. We pulled her out of quality engineering to focus really closely on that, that work of image quality on the cameras. And so like me, she had no standard HR title. She was outside of all of the defined roles in our organizations and in our HR systems. We centered her in all of the decisions in visual imaging. Some of them were quantitative, many of them were qualitative, right? Things like color and exposure, things like noise patterns and sharpening. Not just in the software stack, but everything from the early sensor design and development, the rest of the hardware work, firmware development, through UI and early and, and back into you know, industrial design, in design scenarios. She was so effective at that, and it, and it was so good. We had her build out a small team of photographers and videographers who also had image science and technical skills. And that was hard because our recruiters had to get creative. It didn't, it's not a role that existed in my knowledge or theirs in the industry. So we had to like make up where we went and looked for people and how, how to hire them. But her team fundamentally changed how to build a product that is centered on helping a wide variety of people make professional quality art. 
And um, I have a kind of strange looking image up on screen because the work to create those cameras can look a little odd. The team is trying to reproduce a problem that was shot with video of horses actually running on the beach. And you can see somebody um, with some toys and a table and doing yoga poses. You can ask me about that later if you like. Because when you build cameras, you have to take so many photos repeatedly in a lot of places and complicating matters like we talked about, it's often with confidential hardware. So it was Monique's team who found creative ways to drive technology and design to support all of that tuning and to advocate for processes outside the norm as well as do the deeply technical and artistic work they were doing on the images. They convinced skeptical senior vice presidents to rent and secure houses for us. Uh, we hosted weekly dinners where we turned conference rooms into fancy restaurants and it was always someone's birthday because candles in low light, high dynamic range, it's a real problem. <laughs> And it was interesting because as the camera started to take off and we hired senior leaders in from the camera industry, they often had these like eh? moments when we would turn to Monique for key input at all phases of development and design. You know, I had somebody quite senior in hardware look and say, why are you taking her to see Johnny Ive? Those leaders really quickly did understand the value of her team and their work as they integrated into how we worked though. It was really um, quite magical to see. So that design and marketing, the hardware and firmware and software were all able to work in community with Monique and her team rather than via a rigid ownership model. It was really a testament to everyone's ability to trust Monique's team, right? To trust them to communicate well, to trust them to advocate for the best work and thus sit with the less defined roles. That's some pretty powerful fabric. I know that this kind of work and that her team was deeply at the heart of why the iPhone camera is a favorite of so many pro photographers and cinematographers, and also why many of the rest of us have incredible memories of our families and the places that we love. Working with people who are really different than you, with different skills than you, in roles that you haven't invented yet, believing their experiences and welcoming them into the room, it can really enable you to build such powerful teams. If you're lucky, it might even make you a better photographer. Made me a better photographer. Okay, so through the talk, we're gonna get over to you and let you all talk for a minute, but I'm gonna leave you with an invitation, which is that the next time you find yourself with your hands in the air and at a crossroads, I'd love for you to get curious and name your uncertainty. I want you to find your people, maybe in places you didn't expect, and I really want you to listen to them deeply. I'd invite you to go the hard yard to hold many truths and I know you will find your path through. And when you're working with hardware, always ask for a chicken bit. Just trust me on this one. Um, so that's what I have for you today. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs> <laughs> Look, real actual people. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, the questions are flying in already. Uh, so we're gonna dive straight in because uh, <clears throat> we've got a little, bit, a little bit of time to squeeze as many questions in as possible. Um, first question is, what is easier to deal with, uncertainty or complexity? I think those two things are hard to unknit. <laughs> um, I think examining them together is probably like the question itself is a really brilliant question. Um, because if you can try and unknit them a little bit and see which part is because it's, it's com complex and which part is because you don't know, then you can start using different tools for each of those different things. But um, I've rarely had something uncertain that didn't have a chunk of complexity kind of like clouding the water. <laughs> And the answer to that question is almost a talk in itself, right? <laughs> Probably. I'll write that down. <laughs> um, so another question is, to what extent and how are the ethical or unintended, con unintended consequences of any unknown explored in your processes? That's a large question. <laughs> um, so maybe I'll talk a little bit about my processes today with some of the people that I'm working with today. Um, I would say the first thing is uh, I talk to a lot of people and I talk to a lot of people who aren't like me. Um, I read research. I find out I'm wrong. I try and adjust. And if I don't, if I don't know where I'm going or if in any way, shape or form, everybody looks or sounds like me, I sort of try and shake that up and try and find some more people to help. Um, I spend quite a bit of time with ethicists and I was working on a project at the end at Apple where for the first time I was working on a on a safety critical system and the first thing that I looked at is the way we did we built software was 
not compatible with that and our thought processes. And at that point, I went and found some ethicists and said, can you come and help us construct some systems and ask us hard questions and collaborate with people who are experts in that space? Not the most satisfying answer, but it's a hard topic. I mean, I, I think that was a pretty good solid answer to be fair. <laughs> and the presence of ethicists is one that to be considered, I think, when we're in design processes for sure. Um, another question, another big one. Given these great examples of solving an uncertainty leading to innovation, have you ever deliberately introduced uncertainty into a process or an organization to improve creative output? It's a great question. Um, it sounds actually kind of like the fundamental of a brainstorming exercise. Um, so I, I don't think I can say, no, I've never done that because it sounds a little nefarious, but, but yeah, asking big open-ended questions is a way of introducing uncertainty. I don't think I've ever done anything really nasty, but you know, probably somebody will tweet me and tell me I'm wrong. And I did. <laughs> well, we'll keep an eye on your Twitter feed for that one. Um, and yeah. another question, uh, Vic, Vic Tillotson, uh, one of the producers here, says, so interesting about your undefined role. You describe it in a very positive way, but wondering at what point might you have felt any vulnerability in that position? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. The spot, the, the real big place that I felt vulnerability is when I was working with people outside of Apple. Because not having the title on my card, especially when I was working with people from different cultures where rigid job structures and titles mattered about whether they would look at you and talk to you. I mean, I was already a woman who was extraordinarily technical and running very deep technology teams, which was a problem. <laughs> uh, but if I walked into a room with sensor developers from Japan and had stuff, I mean, I had special agent on my card mostly because it was cheeky, but if I couldn't sign director or senior director or executive, like they didn't know what to make of me and wouldn't engage, which was a problem for me and my team. So that was challenging for sure. Um, at some point, there were times when I couldn't, there were a few times when I couldn't get my job done because I didn't have a title, the same title as one of my peers. And that was frustrating. But at that juncture, um, I had a really great team and a really great boss who advocated deeply and did the work to say this job is classified as a director level position. And I, don't I wonder know if that answered the question. Could, yeah, it does. <laughs> There's just it's, it's spurring another question. I, mean, I wonder how um, you deal with the kind of the issues of like anxiety or anxiety as a kind of significant mental health issue when you're working in uncertain environments. Yeah. Uh, to be fair, I wasn't sleeping enough. <laughs> and I was so focused on all of the work that I was doing that uh, I didn't have any time or space to worry about what I was doing. It was really interesting because in the, in the teams that I was working in, um, and this was really challenging for executives in particular who would come in from outside of Apple into Apple in that era, because you didn't get authority by dint of who reported to you or whose staff you were on or um, your title you got authority or people did things um, because of influence. So if you were useful, <laughs> you got invited into the room and people listened and you did work together. So it was very much focused on the work you were doing. And there's not no problems with that model, but it really helped with a bunch of the things that you're talking about around, you know, imposter syndrome or anxiety about, do I, do I have that? Um, Cause we were all so focused on making <laughs> and on the work um, that if you were working, and you were useful, then like that was all you were thinking about. It was mostly a problem outside or when people from outside would come in. Um, Mandy Rose uh, says, thanks for a, packed talk, a talk packed with insight. Do you have any key observations about managing up and what have you learned about navigating ill-defined or unreasonable objectives? Well, that's a great question. Um, I think it really depends on who is in that channel up from you. Um, I think in any sort of management and any sort of, you know, I learned this from theater is that if your audience doesn't understand you, then you're not, then you're not getting your work done. So in managing up to unreasonable expectations, I think some of the things were to know the communication style that worked for those particular people I was managing up to. Um, I used to coach my team in this, like everything at Apple was run deeply with keynotes. And so some senior ex executives would hone, would like to be told the answer 
and then told the work behind it. Otherwise, they'd spend the whole time trying to guess the answer. Where other executives, you really had to take them on the journey and they didn't want the answer until the answer was done. And so knowing what that exec needed to get their work done, sort of playing to that. And sometimes you just got to be stubborn. I was stubborn a lot. <laughs> I did a lot of saying, can't tell you and I'm not going to tell you a lie. I'm not going to make something up. <laughs> If you want to make a decision, great, but <laughs> I'm not signing up to that, which was not always comfortable. I'm not sure if that answered Mandy. Good. Yeah, she's nodding her head. Yes. <laughs> I'm lucky enough to be in the room with Mandy. <laughs> I'm still, I'm still like, it's been so long since I've been in the room with people. It's delightful. In the room with people and also being serenaded by people from outside within Oasis songs. Hopefully we don't get our video blocked by YouTube on copyright grounds. Um, another question quickly, if we can squeeze a couple more in. Um, Joe Lansdown says, I'm intrigued that you said that you thought you knew it was true that people would want to use phones as cameras. Where did that belief come from? I have no idea. <laughs> that is kind of my superpower. I don't have a good answer. No, okay. I just fine. did. I just, I just knew. <laughs> Um, and one more then, uh, if we can, uh, from Joseph Horton, one of the residents here at the studio. Um, do you think there's a correlation between the resources of an organization or company and their ability to work confidently slash comfortably with uncertainty? Repeat the beginning of that question. Uh, I got lost in the think, second half. That's okay. Uh, do you think there's a correlation between the resources of an organization and their ability to work confidently or comfortably with uncertainty? Well, sure. I mean, I, I think some of it is, res and I guess it depends what you mean by resources. So resources can be a safe working environment. Resources can be enough people. Resources can be enough money or tools. I think having an excess of, res of sort of access to money and tools, um, it can be helpful and remove roadblocks, but being scrappy is also some of the best things we made. We made because we were trying to work around or be scrappy about problems. So I think the resource, the, cor the deep correlation around resource is to have a, a working environment that is safe with people that you trust, where you can ask for help <laughs> and that you don't, that there's not a retaliation for asking for collaboration and people who are willing to be challenged and you being willing to be challenged. Like the whole, like lots of people talk about vulnerability and I think it's a key, a key metric of a resource, which is weird, but true. It's a great note to end on. Uh, I want to say a massive thank you, Mariko, for coming and speaking to us today and to our viewers. Um, I hope we can get you back again sometime soon. Um, before you go, if you're still watching, next week's talk is by Nick Rawlings. And in this talk, Nick explores what they've learned through the R&D process that they've been going through as part of their Bristol and Bath Creative R&D Expanded Performance Project entitled Breathing Systems. They will talk us through their approach to spatial composition and the place of wireless systems in the future of sonic practices. You can get news on all our future talks by heading to watershed.co.uk forward slash studio or following us on Twitter at PM Studio UK or at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram or even by subscribing to our newsletter on our website. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel before you go and hit, give the video a big thumbs up. The more subscribers we get, the more likes we get, the more we can share stories like this. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all again here, same time, same place next week. <laughs>